When uh, preparing for a flight, you always plan for a worst case scenario, and that is an engine failure at the most critical moment during takeoff. Hi, my name is Magnar Nordahl. I'm an ATA tape rating instructor and airline captain. And this channel is all about aviation. Today, I will talk about performance limitations for takeoff. I will use ATR 72 as an example, but the principle is valid for all transport category airplanes. When we calculate performance for takeoff, we must assume that an engine fails at the most critical moment. In order to do this, we must calculate the regulatory takeoff weight, or RTOW. It is limited by structural limitations like max takeoff weight, runway conditions, weather conditions, terrain and obstacles around the airport, and technical status of the airplane. When we calculate a takeoff, we use the following speeds. VSR stall reference speed. This is the speed for maximum lift coefficient at 1 G load factor. It is a little higher than Vs, which is the stall speed or minimum speed where the aircraft is still controllable. The stall speed depends on the weight of the aircraft and the flap setting. ATR 72 has three flap settings, 0, 15 and 30 degrees. Flap 15 is used for takeoff. VMC, minimum control speed. The minimum speed where the airplane can be controlled with the rudder along with one engine inoperative and the other engine at maximum power. VMC is defined on the ground as VMCG and in air as VMCA. V1, takeoff decision speed. If an engine failure happens before V1, the takeoff must be aborted. If an engine fail happens at or after V1, the takeoff must be continued. V1 must be at least VMCG and not higher than VR rotation speed. VR rotation speed. This is the speed where the pilot begins to command the nose up to become airborne. The nose should be rotated with 3 degrees per second up to 8 degrees pitch. VR must be at least 1.05 VMCA and 1.04 VSR. V2, takeoff safety speed. In case of an engine failure at or after V1, the airplane must reach 35 feet at this speed. When the runway is wet or contaminated, the height is 15 feet. This is called a screen height. V2 must be at least 1.1 VMCA and 1.13 VSR, but not higher than 1.25 VSR. For takeoff, the target speed is set to V2 plus 5. This gives a better rate of climb. And here is how the speeds are shown on the airspeed indicators. We also have some definitions when it comes to the runway. Tura, takeoff run available. This is the length of the runway that can be used for takeoff. Asta, accelerate stop distance available. This is Tura plus an eventual stopway. A stopway is an extension of the runway that can be used for emergency stop. If there is no stopway, then Asta equals Tura. Tuda. Takeoff distance available. This is Tura plus an eventual clearway. A clearway is an area free of obstacles at the end of the runway. In case of an engine failure at or after we won, the airplane can use the clearway to climb to the screen height. If there is no clearway, then Tuda equals Tura. When the runway is short, V2 
We must also take into consideration that the aircraft may not be able to line up at the very beginning of the runway. This is called line up elevance, LUA. The main wheels define the takeoff distance and the nose wheel defines the accelerate stop distance. The actual accelerate stop distance is defined as follows. You hold the brakes until power is set. Then you release the brakes and accelerate to V1. An engine fails just before V1. The airplane continues to accelerate for another 2 seconds. One second is pilot reaction time and the other second is airplane reaction time. Then maximum braking is applied until the airplane has come to full stop. The power on the operating engine is in ground idle. The actual accelerate stop distance must not exceed ASTA. Likewise, the actual takeoff distance is defined from brake release until reaching the screen height. The actual takeoff distance must not exceed TODA. And the actual takeoff run must not exceed TORA. The takeoff run is defined as the distance from brake release until lift off plus half of the distance traveled in the air until the airplane reaches the screen height at V2 with one engine failed. You may heard about balanced takeoff. This is when V1 is adjusted to allow accelerate stop distance and takeoff distance to be equal. This has two benefits. It gives better margin as more runway is available in case of an engine failure. And it allows for maximum regulatory takeoff weight when the entire runway is used. Let's have a look at the factors that limit the takeoff weight. The maximum takeoff weight is a structural limitation set by the manufacturer and approved by the aviation authority. One important factor for determining the maximum takeoff weight is that the landing gear must be able to absorb a force of a touchdown with a vertical rate of descent of 360 feet per minute. That's what we call a firm landing. In comparison, at maximum landing weight, the landing gear must be able to absorb the force of a touchdown with a vertical rate of descent of 600 feet per minute. That's what we call a heavy landing. And just to compare, airplanes designed for carrier landings have a limitation of 1500 feet per minute. That's a controlled crash. On ATR-72, the maximum takeoff weight depends on the variance as shown on this table. You must also remember that max zero fuel weight and max landing weight must be respected. If you're not sure about the maximum takeoff weight of the aircraft you're flying, you can check the documentation or on the ATR, the label on the main landing gear strut. The longer the runway, the better. This picture shows Katiklan Airport in the Philippines 10 years ago. At that time, the runway was 900 meters long. And that reduced the takeoff weight from 80 to 72 with 3 to 4 tons. The hill in the background is now removed and the runway extended to more than double the length. An uphill reduces the acceleration but makes it easier to stop. A downhill is good for acceleration but makes it harder to stop. But all in all, a downhill requires a shorter runway and is therefore preferred. The runway can be dry, wet or contaminated, which means that the runway is covered by more than 3 mm water, slush, snow or ice. This affects the ability to accelerate and stop. A dry runway is always the best. Now, back to Katiklan Airport. As I said, this runway was 900 meters long. In a simulated training session, I set up the ATR-72 for takeoff at runway 06 with a weight set to regulatory takeoff weight. I gave the crew an engine failure just before V1 
And in this video, you will see that the engine fails a fraction of a second before the first officer calls V1. And as you will see, aborting a takeoff close to V1 gives you no margin for error. <laughs> Above me is a meta which is a coded weather report from an airport and this one reads wind from 120 degrees at 15 knots, ceiling and visibility ok, temperature 32 degrees celsius, viewpoint 28 degrees celsius and QNH 1008 hectopascal. The wind direction is 120 degrees and the velocity 50 knots. When the wind is not blowing exactly along the runway, we have to calculate the headwind or tailwind component. And this can be done with a figure like this. Let's say the runway direction is 80 degrees. Then the wind is 40 degrees off from the right side. And the headwind component is 11 knots, the crosswind 10. The headwind is always a better fit because it gives you a head start, but sometimes you have no option and have to depart in tailwind. Does a little tailwind make a difference? Oh yes it does. Because when you have to abort a takeoff, the brakes have to absorb all the kinetic energy. In this example the airplane weighs 20 tons and the takeoff is aborted at 100 knots. In zero wind, the ground speed is 100 knots, of course, and the kinetic energy is 26.0 MJ. With 10 knots headwind, the ground speed is 90 knots, and the kinetic energy is 20.6 MJ. With 10 knots tailwind, the ground speed is 110 knots, and the kinetic energy is 32.0 MJ. And that is 55% more than when you had the headwind. The temperature is 32 degrees Celsius. A high temperature reduces the density of the air and the engine and the propeller get less air to work with, resulting in less thrust. A change in the air temperature of 1 degree Celsius changes the density altitude with about 120 feet. Here are three examples. At sea level on a standard day, the temperature is plus 15 degrees Celsius and the density altitude is zero feet. When the temperature is minus 5 degrees, the density altitude is minus 2480 feet, which means that air molecules are packed densely together, like the blue dots on the square to the left. When the temperature is plus 32 degrees, the density altitude is 1945 feet, which means that the air molecules are less densely packed, like the red dots in the square to the right. The air pressure at sea level is 1008 hectopascal. It's called QNH and is used to calculate the pressure altitude of the airport. A change in air pressure of 1 hectopascal changes the pressure altitude by about 30 feet. Here is an example. An airport has an elevation of 800 feet. When QNH is 1013 hectopascal, then the pressure altitude is 800 feet. When the QNH is 1030 hectopascal, then the pressure altitude is 300 feet. And when QNH is 987 hectopascal, then the pressure altitude is 1570 feet. When the static air temperature on the ground is plus 5 degrees Celsius or less, or when in flight the temperature is plus 7 or less, 
and there is visual moisture in the air like fog, clouds, drizzle, rain, snow and the visibility is less than 1500 meters then we have atmospheric icing conditions since ice accumulation on the wing can reduce the lift coefficient and induce stall at less angle of attack than normal the takeoff speeds V1, VR and V2 are increased in this example all takeoff speeds are increased by 9 knots. As I said earlier, we calculate that an engine fails at the most critical moment during takeoff, which is close to V1. Once we have become airborne, we must be able to climb with a gradient of 2.4% up to minimum 400 feet above the runway. This is called the second segment climb. Then we accelerate to the speed for best climb gradient, retract the flaps and set maximum continuous thrust MCT, on the remaining engine. We continue climbing to an altitude where we can start an approach for landing or divert to our takeoff alternate. We must also have to stay clear of terrain and obstacles. The requirement is 35 feet clearance increased with 0.8% of the distance traveled. The margin is small, but the risk of getting an engine failure exactly at V1 is incredibly small. If an engine fails at 100 feet, you already have a much better margin. Here is Katiklan Airport again. 10 years ago, the runway was 900 meters long, and this reduced the takeoff weight by 3 to 4 tons. But the hill in the background required a climb gradient of 4 degrees. And this reduced the takeoff weight with additional 2 tons. And we could carry about 40 passengers on a 50 minutes flight to Manila. I will show another grainy video from the simulator. This time the engine fails between V1 and V2, and they continue the takeoff. The first officer is pilot flying. And again, the crew does everything right. V1 protein. Pass it free. You're up. Engine failure. Right up trim, 100%. Engine 2, feathered. Off. Sometimes we cannot follow the standard instrument departure routes. In such cases, the company is responsible for defining a route when one engine is inoperative. One example is Mahong Son in Thailand. Here you see the airport from west, and we are on approach to runway 11. The approach is based on a VORDME which can be seen in the foreground. Not only is this airport located into a hillside, but it's also the warmest place in Thailand in the extra hot season. The departure is in the opposite direction, runway 29, which is towards us. If an engine fails at V1, we will not be able to climb above the VOR. Therefore, the single engine procedure is Climb runway heading to 2.0 DME, then climbing right turn to heading 360, at 3.0 DME turn right heading 120 and intercept and proceed on VOR radial 070. Continue to climb to 9000 feet. At 10 DME turn left to the VOR and hold. Most airliners have an option to take off with different flap settings. A small flap setting at takeoff requires a longer runway, but gives better rate of climb. A larger flap setting requires a shorter runway, but the rate of climb is reduced. ATR aircraft, however, has only one setting for takeoff, and that is flaps 15. The air condition system takes air from the engine compressors. This is called bleed air. Use of the air conditioning may reduce engine power, 
And under such conditions, we can reduce the takeoff distance by switching off the bleed air. However, the climb performance will not be affected as the air condition is automatically switched off in case of an engine failure. In case of an abort to takeoff, the brakes must be able to stop the airplane safely. This is not a problem with an ATR unless we have tailwind, then we may have to reduce the weight. We are allowed to depart with an inoperative system on certain conditions. For example, if the anti-skid system is inoperative, we need more stopping distance. The first manual to look into is the minimum equipment list, MEL, which is a company version of the master MEL, shown here. We start with the go-no-go -no -go list, and here we can see what we are allowed to fly with. We then proceed to the page for this system, which says that we must follow an operational procedure in AFM, that's the airplane flight manual. The relevant pages show the procedure, how many meters the axial stop distance is increased, in this case about 300 meters. To sum it up, here are all the factors we have to take into consideration when we calculate the regulatory takeoff weight and the takeoff speeds. So, how do we do the calculations? Well, we have four options. All performance data found in the Airplane Flight Manual, AFM. However, it takes hours to do the calculations manually. And this makes the AFM useless when you're planning to take off in 20 minutes. The next option is the Flight Crew Operating Manual, the FCOM. This is our little Bible. It provides simplified performance calculations, which are easier to follow, but the shortcuts give you penalties, especially when departing from short runways or in tailwind. The first accurate and easy to use calculation method is the flight operation software, FOS. This is a computer program that prints out performance charts for specific runways and specific conditions. In the cockpit, we have a bunch of those charts. But I don't have to use them anymore because we have something much better. And that is the Single Point Performance Software, or SPS. This is an iPad application that gives us takeoff performance at the fingertips in seconds. And that's all for this time. Please support the channel by clicking like, subscribe and share with your friends. And please leave comments below, I like to read them. Thank you for watching and happy learning!